next speaker is uh, from right up the road at the University of North Texas. Uh, he's probably going to talk about something that you haven't thought of before. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Chris Chesky. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I first would like to express my appreciation for being invited to this prestigious event and prestigious lecturers. It's quite exciting to be here. Uh, I'm a musician primarily, and I started playing music in fourth grade and proceeded to be a professional and then get my doctorate, and now I work at the University of North Texas. I'm just kind of curious, how many in the audience, by a show of hand, have been trained in the public schools of music, or public schools in Texas, as in band or choir orchestra? Look, at, look around, everybody. Well, we're in a new day, folks, and that uh, new day is expressing a need to address all the occupational health problems that occur that are associated with learning and performing an instrument. And uh, in large part, the transformation of the music discipline has come from studies done at North Texas. So those of us in Texas can be proud that we're sort of spearheading this agenda nationally. As uh, Randy Dick mentioned a few minutes ago, the National Association of Schools of Music has uh, adopted, ratified an accreditation standard for all music schools in the United States, so it's mandatory that we instruct music students about hearing loss, mental health, musculoskeletal problems, and vocal health concerns. While that said, we also see the influence of that agenda in our public school. In fact, the TEACH requirements in the state of Texas for fine arts are now requiring teachers to address the same things. So, as we're in part of, in, you know, started moving into this new arena, we recognize that the musician community is vastly understudied and underserved. We don't know much about what to do. We have very little research. And at the same time, we have some agendas that are perhaps productive, but maybe in some cases not as productive as we would like. And I want to showcase a little bit through an example of how some of these models that are being applied to address hearing health because they're not really specific to musicians, can create more problems than solve them. And the big message is that as we think about applying sports models and theories and applied approaches to help musicians, we need to really understand the musician community thoroughly before proceeding. So that's the idea here, that if we take the protocols that have been developed to walk into a factory and apply them to a, a music ensemble or a music school, would they be appropriate? So before I get into that, the University of North Texas has a 10, 15 year history in addressing hearing loss, and if anybody's interested in reading about that history, I'd recommend that you go to this particular journal article. So when the United States federal agencies of OSHA and NIOSH decided that it was important to uh, deal with this, a lot of the, or uh, deal with uh, exposure levels in factories, a lot of the approaches were based on the idea that this hazard is something that we don't want. So somebody going into a factory or a, a mill or a shipyard and the noise is loud, the noise is undesirable. And the approaches to mitigating that hazard are irrelevant to the quality or the importance or the desire to have that noise. That's one of the primary reasons why we think some of these approaches are counterproductive. <clears throat> and, but unfortunately, some of the models that come from this particular industrial hygiene perspective are being applied to music. For example, uh, somebody would take a meter like that into a music school, which is called a dosimeter, and apply these standards and determine whether or not there's a hazard. As recently as uh, 2011, CDC went out to a school in Alabama and applied these methodologies, and after two days of measurement, they concluded that, wow, this is a hazardous situation. We need to build a new building. We need a new, need a new hall. We need acoustic modifications. And until that can be figured out, everybody wear earplugs. So what's the problem with that? Well, because we track sound levels in our ensembles at the University of North Texas every day, and we've been doing it for many years, and we've got hundreds of of uh, exposure level indices for ensemble classes, we know that two days is insufficient to label anything other than that one day. You can't generalize that kind of data. So what you're looking at here is a 15-week semester of dose data. That red line represents 100% of allowable noise exposure, 
as defined by the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health. And over the 15-week period, these two different ensembles practiced four times a week in the same room, the same type of music, in this case it was big band, and in the same seats, the same instrumentation. And what do you see? You see huge variability from day to day. So go ahead and pick any two days and try to generalize whether or not that's risky. And more importantly, we also note that while there are some that are over that red line, there's lots that are under that red line. So what's going on under that red line that we might learn about and modify our instructions so that we don't exceed that red line? So this is what we've been doing at the University of North Texas. Here's Kenton Hall, our prestigious lab band uh, rehearsal space named after Stan Kenton. And you can see on the right-hand side an active real-time monitoring system that's not only logging and tracking and analyzing the data, it's also providing it in real time to the instructor. This is the uh, dissertation by a computer science PhD student right now. We've got other engineering approaches to helping us understand what's going on. So before we start applying this industrial hygiene approach and saying, hey, wear earplugs or get a new building, we need additional research and understand that the primary factor for elevated risk is our musical behavior. All of you in music know that when we make music, the outcome of it is how we make our music. And if we're in ensembles, depending upon the instructor. So in regards to earplugs, I want to read a couple of quotes here that are from prestigious audiologists at the University of Pittsburgh's medical school. And there's a clinic up there specifically for musicians. And she has written in the same words in both of these magazines or journals. So we would not consider allowing our youth to play football without a helmet. Fair. Yet every day we allow our children to participate in school-sponsored instrumental music activities without hearing protection. The most successful music education programs require the use of earplugs as opposed to making them or making hearing protection optional. So this is suggesting, and I believe there's actually some schools in Pittsburgh where they're making kids, middle school and high school, put earplugs in their ears before and dur during rehearsals. I don't know of any studies that have quantified any effect of that or have actually quantified the levels that would deem that environment to be sufficient or warrant ear protection. It's a little bit of the cart before the horse. Another problem with this is that we're not sure that these earplugs actually function the way they do. Now, the CDC report specified musician flat attenuating earplugs. Now, to those in audiology or in the music world who pay attention to this, know that that refers to a very specific product line, this trademark. The musician earplug product is a trademark product by Edemotic Research in Chicago. And they make this custom version that costs two, three hundred dollars. Audiologist squirts some silicone in your ear canal, makes a mold, bores out a hole, puts a cap on it, and you put it in your ear and you're supposedly able to hear the music as it would normally sound, but at a lower level. And then there's a non-custom version of that that's uh, patented and trademarked, and it's sold under various names, but it's the same product. And this is the kind of thing that's marketed to public schools all across the state of Texas and the nation. It's sold under various names and by a company, Fender, Right? You might be aware of Fender amps, Fender guitars. Uh, Vic Firth is a, a drumstick company that's now selling these products. It's a gigantic industry that's reaching out to the music community. So we can ask ourselves, well, what's, what's the deal with these? Do they actually work, or are these appropriate for our students? And the reason I'm asking that is because the testing protocol that the EPA requires for all earplugs again, was designed with the intent that an earplug would go into a fact or be used by a person in a factory setting. The standard for measuring the earplug, these earplugs were developed in the 50s. And what they're measuring is a frequency range that's specifically connected to what would go on in a factory. It was never intended to provide a measurement or assessment of how an earplug would function if it was in a music environment. But when you look at an earplug package, and if you look at these products, you'll see these graphs. And this comes from this procedure called real ear at threshold, which is the required EPA standard for testing. Well, what's interesting about this is that the frequency range, like I said, may not be sufficient to understand music. 
to give you an idea, here's the piano. Those red vertical bars are the test points, or the frequency-specific testing protocols that are assessed during that re-add. It goes down to 125 hertz, which you can see leaves out much of the bottom part of the piano. And the testing protocol, because it requires humans to perceive the lowest level of sound at these frequencies, it's very difficult to do that even below 400 hertz, which is where the end of that bracket with the question mark ends. So you imagine putting your finger over your ear or something in your ear and trying to detect the lowest level of low frequency sound. It's very difficult. So basically, we don't know if these products are protecting people with these low frequencies that are a major component of the music that we produce in our bands. So a couple of years ago, we started testing these objectively using a protocol that was much more refined, much more likely to pick up the nuances of musical uh, spectral components, and we measured all the way down to the lowest frequencies. And we see something very different that's marketed to the students. More concerning, we see that for some of these products, the low frequency energy does go through these plugs without being blocked. So here's an example of the data that we have. This is for the ER15 custom plug. This, this line represents the difference between the sound inside a simulated ear canal with and without plugs. So if it was a flat attenuating plug, that line would be flat. It means that the reduction of sound would be equal across frequency. You can clearly see that that line is not flat. Those vertical bars are the test points that the REAT procedure uses, which is the APA requirement. And if you look and you connect the dots according to the REAT, you would get that kind of line. But what's missing? All this, all that, all that, all that. And most importantly, when you look at specifically at this ER20 plug, the one that's mass marketed to our public schools, we can see here on the left, the sound level energies inside of a canal. And you can see it's very, very high on the low frequencies. And you can see the, the energy measured inside the canal with the plug, which is the green line. You subtract those two lines, you get the one on the right. That's far from flat, and it lets those low frequency energy levels through without being blocked. When you calculate how much protection you're getting, you can see that it's not giving you 20 decibels of protection, only 4.8, which is a major problem. So all these marching band uh, uh, activities where people are putting in these earplugs, believing they're getting protected, aren't. Especially those who are playing things like bass drums and tubas and trombones, low brass, all that low frequency stuff is being unattenuated. So, as we're moving into this new era of the music field, we need to generally think about the applicability of certain protocols when we bring it into our world of music. And this also includes sports science. The way we might prepare a, an athlete for an endeavor may be inappropriate to, play or, to prepare a flutist for a concert. We don't know, we haven't done those kind of studies. So before we jump too far into the future, let's set up some research and figure it out. So if anybody's interested in following up with this particular discussion, we've written two papers that are gonna be published in the next issue of a journal that's published by the Mer uh, Music Teachers National Association. It's coming out literally in a week. Here's a table of contents. And what we're doing here is we're trying to create awareness that this is a major problem within the performing arts and the music and the audiology communities by drawing attention to this issue. In addition to calling for new standards, which we're doing with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, we're also trying to develop some protocols. It's very difficult to establish what a new earplug might be, and earplugs are probably a very valuable tool that all musicians should be aware of. But before we start developing, we need, we need an appropriate metrics to evaluate them. Uh, so if anybody's interested, this would be where you would look. Thank you very much. I'm over, I'm over here. <laughs> I didn't bring my harmonica. <laughs> so, a great talk, Chris. We have uh, a, a couple of questions that we've uh, received from the audience. One of them, is there any way to regain hearing? No. There are studies that are looking at uh, pharmacologic interventions to slow the, the degenerative process of, of hair cells in the cochlea soon after extensive exposures, but there's no reversing this. 
Um, I just had another one here. Uh, being a former drummer, this is from Kimberly at uh, Texas A&M Kingsville. Being a former drummer and using earplugs before while playing, it has affected my playing. Has research been done for percussionists using earplugs? Well, the, the, there's a lot of concern uh, within uh, the performing arts community to the extent that when you use an earplug, you may play louder to compensate for the decreased ability to hear what you're playing. So we know that drummers have wrist problems and back problems and stuff like that, in many cases due to the excessive forces, the, 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 you know, the biomechanics of playing. So if you're playing with earplugs, you may actually be bearing down on your instrument with more energy, creating uh, a musculoskeletal problem. Um, the alteration in the sounds haven't been studied that much, not that I'm aware of with drums, although we did one anecdotal study with a small percussion group at UNT where we gave them all these ER20 plugs and we had them use them for a couple weeks and we came in and we recorded their rehearsal playing the same music with and without the plug. And we didn't analyze the data, but you could clearly hear there was something different about the quality of the music. So we asked them to do it again and they talked amongst themselves, said, let's do this piece. And what was really fascinating is that this next piece included vocal stuff. So they're playing their hand drums, and it kind of sounded the same. Well, they did it without the plugs, and it was beautiful. And then they put the plugs in, and it had the same difference. And then they started singing, and they were looking around at each other like, wow, because they, they were having a hard time understanding whether they were balanced. Right. And you could clearly hear the level of their vocalization changed. There's another study out of Poland recently where it looked at the spectral outputs of brass instruments with and without the custom fitted plugs. And so uh, musicians were trained to be able to play something repeatedly and have it look very much the same. And then they would start comparing that to what it would look like with earplugs. And you could clearly see a modification in the spectral content, as you would expect based on the data I'm just seeing, I'm showing you, to the, the tone output. And that's a huge issue. So the, the primary, the primary uh, thing, that the, the primary stimulus that a musician requires is the sound. Everything is based on what they're hearing. So if you have some alteration in this pathway to really get in touch with these tonal characteristics, you can have a major serious effect on, on the development of tone perhaps, and that's why I'm concerned about having kids wear these while they're learning how to do that, but also modifications. So if I tell you, hey, you play these plugs, but by the way, your tone of your bass is going to sound different, right. you'd probably be less enthusiastic. Right. So it's a, it's a conundrum. You want to save your hearing, but yet you want to save your tone as well. Yes. Yeah. We're going to leave the audience with that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Please join me in thanking you.